Hello and welcome to Rocket Room 101. I'm your host, Ashley McIsaac. This is episode 5, The Russians Are Coming to Outer Space, Korolev, Sputnik, and The Race for Space, Part 2. In Part 1, we discussed the Russians and Sergei Korolev moving forward with the development of the V-2 um, from World War II, of course, and the Nazis. Now, the Russians, as I discussed, didn't even receive enough parts and equipment to assemble one V-2. The Americans, on the other hand, uh, had enough to uh, assemble a hundred of them. So, uh, after a few years of, uh, of some uh, um, retooling uh, with uh, what Korolev had, uh, as I discussed, uh, he created the R-1 and R-2 rockets. The R-1 was simply a Soviet-made V-2 rocket. The R-2 was a V-2, a Soviet-made V-2, a stretch version. Could go a lot farther, and uh, Korolev had made some really um, uh, revolutionary breakthroughs in rocket technology at that time. Now, um, the R-1, R-2 uh, hit service in 1951. And um, at the same time that was going on, Korolev was, uh, at least on paper, designing uh, kind of the next generation of rockets. He knew that if a rocket was going to fly great distances and to certainly uh, to carry the giant warheads of the day, uh, he uh, was going to have to come up with something called staging. That there's no way uh, one complete rocket with one giant engine was going to be able to fly the, the entire distance, whether it be to the other side of the planet or into orbit. That it would be... Uh, conceivably a better idea, and we'll use the Saturn V rocket that put man on the moon for example, that you could use a rocket and use separate stages of the rocket. So as the rocket took off and, and the bottom part or the first part used up all of its rocket fuel and oxidizer, that would simply just release and fall away from the ship. And of course would reduce uh, weight tremendously. And of course um, the rest of the rocket would continue on until, you know, that part or that section uh, exhausted all of its fuel. That would drop away, leaving, uh, in terms of uh, this case, three stages and the final part to reach apogee or orbit. So that was the R3 concept on paper. Now, the R3 was very important and moved the Soviet space, the whole Soviet space program forward at a time where the medium range and short range rockets um, were not seen to be as needed as much for what the Soviets purposes were. As uh, for example, uh, a member of the Public Bureau named Jorge Malenkov in 1947 he was an associate of uh, Joseph Stalin and made a comment to Stalin in a meeting saying, well, in the next war we will not be fighting Poland. And this was referring, referring to, excuse me, to the, um, the short ranges uh, of the R1 and R2. So the R3 concept uh, was going to show that rockets could travel farther. And so while, you know, Korolev was fumbling around with the R3 on paper, uh, he had created the R5, and that was another medium-range missile, but put into service in 1955, uh, and um, uh, was very effective, once again, in the steps necessary to get the big space rockets going. Now, uh, it, during the R3 and R5, uh, one man joined the team that would be as important to Soviet space uh, as Sergei Korolev would be, and his name was Valentin Glushko. Glushko was responsible for the engine part of the rocket. Uh, Korolev took care of everything else, but Glushko was the rocket engine designer. And uh, him and Korolev uh, never got along. Uh, they rarely got along, uh, I should say. Um, uh, the only thing they ever had in common was, um, I talked about last week, Korolev was serving actually a, a sentence, uh, a 10 year sentence, uh, from the Stalin purges of the 1930s, well, so was Valentin Glushko. So both men were in the 50s, um, uh, at least up to 1953 before Joseph Stalin died, were actually still uh, political prisoners, officially. Um, now, I wouldn't feel too sorry for them because they were actually given their own design bureaus. Uh, 
Um, and uh, when Stalin, like I say, died in '53, most of these outrageous charges um, against these people and scientists and uh, were dropped. Um, Khrushchev uh, was uh, a, you know, uh, a lot less of a hardliner in many spots uh, than um, uh, Joseph Stalin was. So, anyway, moving on. Glusko and Korolev was a very key element in terms of um, uh, the Soviet space program. Now, in this time of history, uh, everyone knows about the atom bombs being detonated to end World War II in 1945. Um, well, what a lot of people don't realize is that was the uh, atom bomb. Uh, that was not the next step in the process, which is the H-bomb or the hydrogen bomb, or you could call it the thermonuclear warhead. Now, this is uh, very important, and uh, w ironically, as I'm talking about rockets, this technology coming along at the same time influenced everything that I'm talking about. So, uh, this is a scale V2, for example, 145th the scale. Here is the size of your nuclear warhead in 1945. Um, obviously not practical, impossible to put inside of this rocket. So, of course we know that the Americans were king of the bomber, they had the B-17 super fortress, they had the B-29. This would be placed in the bay of those bombers, fly over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, gone. Um, now, no one else had that type of capability. The Americans were the only ones, A, well at the time, to have the bomb and have the giant planes to drop them. Well, in the early 50s, uh, some interesting things came along and once again, science moved along and the bomb, the thermonuclear warhead went from that size to this size. Um, and this has a lot to do with, as this transformation was happening, the size differences in the American rocket versus the Russian rockets. The Russians were making their rockets for a thermonuclear warhead somewhere in between these sizes, where the Americans were making their rockets for a thermonuclear warhead this size, because they knew they were going to be able to accomplish that in a very short amount of time, and they did by the 1950s. So, um, the marriage of the thermonuclear warhead and the rocket was happening all about uh, around this time and really influenced everything that I'm talking about in terms of uh, the innocence of the space exploration and the military aspect. So with the R5 complete, uh, Korolev moved on um, really back to that R3 original plan with, it, with the multiple staging. And what came of that was uh, what a rocket that would ultimately uh, put um, Sputnik into orbit, Yuri Gagarin into orbit, and uh, be the most successful, successful, excuse me, launch vehicle in Soviet Union history. That is the R-7 Samyorka, also called the SS-6 Sapwood, uh, that's the NATO designation. Now, uh, this uh, rocket came along in 1957, um, and it was the brainchild of Sergei Korolev. Now, um, what really gave this rocket its luster and its power was what Glushko added to it. And the, what Glushko added to it, and I could almost use um, my uh, R5 rocket, excuse me, uh, as, a, as an example, is he had an engine called the RD-108, and that was placed in the center of the rockets. Okay, oh, this is a great example. So the RD-108 was placed in the center of the rocket. Four other engines called RD-107s were placed along or around the rocket, just as you see here. Now, the RD-108 in the middle was the sustainer, and that would stay with the uh, R-7 the entire flight. Uh, the other four engines operated the side boosters, as you see, uh, that were attached uh, to the body of the rocket. Um, and that, at some point in the flight, um, when the fuel was exhausted from those engines and from those boosters, they would detach and fall away from the ship. And then uh, the rest of the uh, vehicle, like I say, would, uh, would move on to its intended target. So, um, Glushko uh, really put all this together. He had some problems with the R3. Uh, him and uh, Korolev never got along on a couple of points with the R3. 
but changed the configuration and added uh, really solved some minor problems by adding 20 combustion um, chambers and that was what was needed uh, was multiple combustion chambers not one a large one and that was, that was needed to handle the 504 tons of thrust the R7 was going to be kicking out, okay? Now, the, in relation to, you know, 504 tons of thrust sounds like a lot. Well, the V2 rocket, which was, you know, uh, an unbelievable rocket um, just, you know, what, uh, a little over a decade earlier had 28 tons of thrust. So, we're talking about uh, something um, quite a bit different and uh, a lot more powerful. So 1957 uh, leading up to uh, the fall of 1957, the R7 had uh, nine failures and 18 successes. So there was no guarantees with it. Now uh, on August 4th, um, they had one of their great successes. Korolev launched it uh, from their launch pad in Turretam in the Soviet Union. And, um, it flew 8,000 kilometers into the Pacific Ocean before dumping its payload successfully. Now, ironically, it flew over the Kamchatka Peninsula where uh, Korolev had served a year of his sentence in the uh, gulags of uh, uh, the Colma mines, the gold mines uh, that I had mentioned in the earlier episodes. So, that was in August of 57. Uh, successful uh, flight, they were ready to go. Uh, October came along, uh, leading up to October, uh, Korolev had uh, designed this cool little device that uh, he wanted to place into orbit to let the world know that the communists had beaten the capitalists to space. And that was very important to Korolev. So October 4th, 1957, the R-7 lifted off with Valentin Glushko's engines, Sergio, uh, Sergei um, Korolev's uh, rocket built uh, nicely with his um, Sputnik satellite inside. It was no bigger than a basketball. It emitted a radio beacon and he made sure of this that it was able to be picked up by anybody on earth with a simple transistor radio on its longitude or latitude path. So um, yeah, uh, it, it was very successful. Um, and what happened was when that radio beacon reached the United States, America and American lives would be changed forever. And uh, it absolutely cannot underestimate the importance of this day and this event. A, for the Soviets, good for them. They reached space before the Americans. Um, uh, but it really opened the eyes of the United States um, and uh, into uh, the Soviets uh, um, really know-how in uh, their rockets. They really, once again, it, it was a socialist society so the Soviet Union wouldn't uh, headline their rockets and their launches. Um, they certainly headlined uh, Sputnik and uh, once again not only was America but the world was opened up to this event. Um, so the R7 would eventually um, uh, be um, reconfigured once, like I say, uh, near the end of the 50s, the nuclear thermonuclear warhead really went down to this size. So the R7 was configured as a ICBM. And by 19, uh, by the early 60s, uh, 1962, it was uh, in service as an ICBM. Uh, it was terrible as a missile for the army or for the military to defend your nation. Because the R-7, uh, like its counterpart in America, the Atlas rocket, as great as they are or were as space launch vehicles, um, they took 24 hours uh, to fuel up. Okay, so it wasn't very practical to use when uh, World War III was, uh, was knocking at your door uh, to have to sit there and wait 24 hours to fuel a rocket. Just not very practical at all. But I can't stress it enough, the R-7 um, that would launch uh, Gargarian into space, would launch Soyuz uh, into space in the 70s, uh, late 60s, 70s, it was the primary launch vehicle for the Soviet Union for the next 50 years. 
like I say, not much of an ICBM, and they eventually canceled it out as an ICBM in the uh, middle 60s uh, for a newer, uh, better technology in, in rocketry, uh, namely the R16, but we'll get into that at some other point. But like I said, as a launch vehicle, it was um, the greatest launch vehicle uh, in the history of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union owe Sputnik and Yuri Gargarin to the R7 and Sergei Korolev and Valentin Glushko. And so, well, that's episode 5 of Rocket Room 101. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you haven't seen episode 4, watch episode 4. It leads into episode 5. And next week is going to be a really cool episode because... Uh, we're going to find out what the what the Americans were up to at this point. And uh, I've done the research on the Americans. Uh, they were doing not a whole lot up until the early 50s. But uh, I got some really cool stories uh, and some interesting characters that came uh, out of the United States at that time. So thanks for watching. I appreciate it. I'm your host, Ashton McIsaac, and we'll see you next Saturday for an all-new episode of Rocket Room 101. Bye-bye.